Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, whether you are here for the very first time today, or whether you've been coming for weeks, months, like I have been, years, or even decades, I know. Some have been coming for decades, which I find amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're glad you are here this morning to worship our good God together. How are you doing this morning? I see thumbs up, I see smiles, and I see Sunday's bests. Maybe not as much as with the Portuguese. <laughs> they dress up a bit more, but I still see no one is here in their tracksuits or... So that's, that's still good. But maybe, maybe if it was just you and me and no one was around, maybe you would have given me a different answer. Maybe you would not have smiled so much, or maybe you would have said, it's a bit difficult at the moment. I know for some of us, church is maybe hard today. Maybe it's not easy to be here. Maybe it wasn't an easy decision for you today to go through the church doors, or to even make your way here. Maybe you're smiling right now, and you're looking like you have it all together, but you know you don't. Maybe church is hard for you this morning for very various reasons. But let me assure you, you are not alone. I, f I stumbled upon, a, I would call it poem, the other day, which really touched me. It was uh, published in 2019, so maybe you've read it before, but I would like to read it to you. It's called Church is Heart. Church is Heart. Church is hard for the person walking through the doors afraid of judgment. Church is hard for the pastor's family under the microscope of an entire body. Church is hard for the prodigal soul returning home, broken and battered by the world. Church is hard for the girl who looks like she has it all together, but she doesn't. Church is hard for the couple who fought the entire right to service. Church is hard for the single mom surrounded by couples holding hands and seemingly perfect families. Church is hard for the widow and widower with no invitation to lunch after service. Church is hard for the deacon with an estranged child. Church is hard for the choir member overwhelmed by the weight of the lyrics in that song. Church is hard for the man insecure in his role as a leader Church is hard for the wife who longs to be led by a righteous man. Church is hard for the nursery volunteer who desperately longs for a baby to love. Church is hard for the single woman and single man, praying God brings them a mate. Church is hard for the teenage girl wearing a scarlet letter, ashamed of her mistakes. Church is hard for the sinners, church is hard for me. Maybe you can find yourself in one of these lines or have in the past. Church can be hard at times because I think on the outside it all looks shiny and perfect. We've got Sunday's best in behavior and in dress. But oftentimes, or I would say all the time, underneath all these layers, what do we find? We find a body of imperfect people. We find selfish motives, sorrow, pain, arrogance, and fear, all sitting together in one room. And that is exactly what the church is about. It's not about purple who come here and have it all together. And the poem continues like this. Church is a group of sinners, saved by grace, living in fellowship as saints. Church is a refuge for broken hearts. Church is a converging of confrontation and invitation where sin is confronted and the hearts are invited to seek restoration. Church is a lesson in faith and trust. Church is a bearer of burden and a giver of hope. Church is family, a family coming together, setting aside differences, forgetting past mistakes, rejoicing in the smallest of victories. And the last line goes, church, the body and the circle of sinners turned saints is where he resides. 
And I think when church is hard, it's often easy to lose sight of what matters or who matters. But what is important is that God meets us here this morning. God meets us here in this church, in this building. He meets us in our pain and in our hardships. And he knows why church may be hard for you this morning. And oftentimes there are no easy answers or quick fixes to your problems or your hardships. Sometimes it involves waiting on the Lord or wrestling with him in prayer for years, months, or even decades. But we have his promise, which is our comfort in Psalm 34, verse 18. Anyone knows what it says there? The Lord is close to the, to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. God is a God who sees, who hears, and who cares, especially about the brokenhearted, which we all are in some, to some degree, and he has not forgotten you. Let me say a quick prayer. God, Father, I want to thank you this morning for for meeting us here, Father. I want to thank you for everyone that made it here, that made it through these doors, even if it was hard for them, God. I thank you for yeah, this body of believers, God. I thank you that we don't have to have it all together to be here. God, thank you for being close to us in our brokenheartedness, God. Thank you for your comfort, God. And thank you that this is a place where we can come as we are, God. I pray, God, that you would speak to us today, that you would comfort us, that you would give us exactly what we need this morning, each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. We will now have a time of worship. We're singing, not just singing songs to God, but we're worshiping the God who is close to the brokenhearted. <laughs> who paints the skies into glorious day? Who breathes his life into fists of clay? Only the splendor of Jesus. Who shapes the valleys and brings the rain? Only the splendor of Jesus. Who makes the desert to live again? Glorious, 
What a powerful name it is. And as we're having a time of, of prayer now, let us remember that. Let us remember the one that we pray to, he's all powerful. And maybe that helps us to pray more boldly. Maybe that helps us to not just pray, maybe God, could you please, if possible, but maybe that helps us to pray really bold prayers, knowing there's nothing that he cannot do. And I want us to pray together now as a church. And you can thank God, you can worship him, but you can also pray for whatever is on your heart. And maybe you've been sitting in church and saying, why do we never pray for the missionaries in Mozambique? Or why do we never pray for the persecuted church in North Korea? Now is your chance. If that's on your heart, then let's bring it to God. Let's bring it before him. You can pray about your neighbor who you so desperately want to hear and believe the gospel. Pray about anything that is on your heart and remember that he is all powerful. Let's pray and I will close the prayer.
And Father, I want to pray for all the people groups in this world, God, that do not know you, not because they don't want to, God, but because they can't, they don't have the word in your language, and they don't have a church in their people group, God. There's too many of those, Father, and God, we pray that you would send workers. God, we pray that you would send workers from, from this church and from churches all over, God. God, we pray that we would not act with indifference. God, you have called us to go and make disciples, God, and I pray that we would all do our part. God, I pray that you would put it on our hearts to pray for those, to give our resources, or to go. Father, I pray that every nation and every tribe and every people group will have a chance to know you, God, to read your word, and to worship you, Father. God, you've heard all our prayers, and you're all powerful. We commit everything to you, God, and we trust you with our prayers, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we get to hear the Bible reading for today, and then immediately after the sermon. I'll just use this, Andrew. I gave myself a task that I strongly dislike, reading the passage. It's a very, very long one. Uh, it's 62 verses. I think that will take half of my sermon today, which is good. Let me make sure. At all this time. Bear with me just for. All right. So, the reading today, or the passage that we will be 
looking at today is Genesis chapter 41. It's got, as I said, oh, it's not 60, it's 57 verses here. 57. It's still long for me. Reading 10 verses is what it is, let alone reading 57 verses. I would ask someone to come and do that for me, but I'll brave up and do it. But let me just give a bit of context of this passage and almost like not give apology, but just say, this is not what I'm going to be dealing with. One of the things that I will not be dealing with in this passage is the difficult question of whether God put Joseph through the trial that he went through in order to achieve his purpose. Did God put Joseph through it? Did God send Joseph into slavery? Did he send him from slavery to prison only in order to bring him to the palace? I'm not going to answer, try to answer that question because we could spend the whole day here. It's a theme in many passages of the Bible. We look at Pharaoh, we ask a similar question. We look at Judas and maybe we would be tempted to ask the same question. But very quickly, I think the idea of this passage is that God, through the messiness of this world, God still works out his purpose. Through the sin that surrounds us, through the brokenness that surrounds us, through the acts that we cannot really control or defend ourselves against, God still can achieve or achieves his purpose for our lives. And so the message really of this uh, chapter is God's faithfulness, God's faithfulness amidst human wickedness. Let me ask these, just a few quiz questions. When we think about Abraham, we see the patriarchs from Abraham, we got the children of Abraham, and then we got the the two children of uh, Isaac, and from Isaac we got uh, Jacob and Esau. If I were to ask who were the most important people among the patriarchs, who would you say, between Isaac and Ishmael, who would you say is the most important of the two? It's okay, be safe on your answer. Yes, I, I would say, okay, let me be fair a bit. It's within the covenant. When we look at them from the covenant perspective, who would you say was the most important of the two? Isaac. Esau and Jacob, who would you say, the older or younger son? Jacob. Jacob's 12 children, who is the most important? Joseph. Oh, that's where the tricky bit was. Judah. Judah. Thank you. From Jacob's wives, who was the most important one? Rachel. Those are the two, two tricky ones that I had for you. I say within the covenant perspective, from looking at it from the covenant point of view, Rachel was not the most important one, because it is not from Jacob that we have J Judah, which then makes it that the actual Joseph, even though we focus so much on him, is not the most important character if we look at the covenant that God makes with the people of Israel. It is a supporting actor, a very important character, yet it's not through him that the covenant carries on. Does that make sense? It's Ju through Judah, the daughter of the one that was not loved by her husband. This brings us to a few other disclaimers. Here, we will not look at how God called Joseph, 
giving him dreams, dreams that got him into trouble, how he was with him when he was a slave and how he still was with him in prison, enabling him to, try, uh, to interpret dreams of two of Pharaoh's servants. But just a quick one, uh, in chapter 40, we have Pharaoh getting upset and angry with his two servants, and he sends them to prison. And when they get there, they meet Joseph. And one night, they both had a dream. And they were bothered by that dream. And then they were just kind of downcast because that kept on bothering them. And as Joseph sees that, he asked them what was going on, and they tell him the dream. And Joseph, having received the revelation of the meaning of those dreams, he gives one bad news and one good news. And we read uh, towards the end of chapter 40, he says that Joseph asked the chief butler, he says, remember me. Remember to mention me to Pharaoh. He says, what is it? Uh, Joseph said, okay, he interpret, and he says, remember me when you get to Pharaoh, so you can take me out of this place. I've been unfairly kind of sent to prison. This is not where I belong. I belong out there. And so, and he says, I didn't do this. I did not deserve to be in this place, basically. He says, when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. A few lines later, we are told that as he goes out, he forgets about Joseph. It was Joseph's hope. And that hope would disappear. Verse 23 of chapter 40 says, The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Let's read. He says, for chapter 41, he says, when, Pharaoh, when two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile, went out of the river, there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the riverbank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream, seven years of corn, seven years of corn, of corn, healthy and good, were growing on a side stalk, on a single stalk. After them, seven other ears of corn sprouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin ears of corn swallowed up the seven healthy, full of ears. Then Pharaoh woke up, it had been a dream. In the morning, his mind was troubled, so he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them this dream, his dreams, but none, no one could interpret them for him. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, today I am reminded of my shortcomings Pharaoh was once angry with his servants and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams and he interpreted them for us giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man 
was impaled. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one, no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, said Joseph, replied Joseph to Pharaoh. But God, God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile. When out of the river there came, came up seven cows, fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I had never seen such ugly cows in the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first. But even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. Then I woke up. In my dream, I saw seven ears of corn full of good growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other ears sprouted withered and thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin ears of corn swallowed up the seven good ears. I told this to the mag magicians, but none of them could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears of corn are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterwards are seven years. So are the seven worthless ears of corn scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt. But seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance of Egypt, in Egypt will be forgotten. And the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. Just a quick pause. If the double dream meant that God will certainly do it, perhaps this can tell us also that the double dreams that Joseph had were the certainty, the confirmation that God will indeed do what he had shown him. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh and to be kept in the cities for food. The story goes on. I thought it was going to take me half my time, but it will take more than that. So I'll pause there and just kind of go through the key things about this story. So in this story, we really have in the beginning, Joseph in prison, and suddenly Pharaoh has dreams. He had been forgotten. Chapter 40 ends, as I said earlier, with the chief cupbearer not remembering him. He forgot about jo Joseph. It's almost like the clothes, you know, it, I went to see, to watch the performance on 
actors, and I was so impressed. I had to bring this up. Uh, we've got some stars among us. Uh, and next time they perform, make sure you turn up. It was so good. But the, cl the closure of chapter 40 was almost like the closure of the curtain. And then the author spares us the pain of seeing hope disappearing from Joseph. He was hopeful in the beginning when the chief cupbearer left the prison. He says, remember me. But then he forgets about him. And then when the curtain opens again, it was two years later. And then Pharaoh has the dream. But Pharaoh calls in Pharaoh's dream. I'm not, I'm not going to try to interpret the dreams. Curtains open. The story is fast forward two years. Moses, uh, Moses pierces the agony of seeing Joseph hopelessness graduating, converting into hopelessness, hopefulness being converted into hopelessness. Hope in the man has his brilliant plan of getting out of prison was frustrated. Meanwhile, Pharaoh has two dreams, two very unusual dreams. One thing he was sure of was that those dreams were not ordinary dreams. They were special because they kept bothering him. He had to find out what the meaning was. But in the whole land of Egypt, the magicians, the masters, the, the great interpreters of dreams, those who, who read also of uh, stars and could used to interpret the dreams. By the way, they had specialists of interpretation of dreams back in those days. The Magi, when we read about them, there were people that could read on the signs in the skies. And so there was almost like this textbook that they would refer back to, to just interpret things that are not of ordinary. But he calls out all the resources that he had, and none of those people could really give him a satisfactory answer or interpretation to his dreams. Some could have said, oh, you'll have seven daughters, but he will lose them all. None interpret the dreams. It was then that the man that Joseph had relied on to get him out of prison finally remembers. Oh, I remember now, there is this Hebrew boy that was in prison that told us the meaning of our dreams and they, came, they turned out exactly how he interpreted them. I was restored and the other man was impaled. And then from 14 to 16, we see Pharaoh summoning Joseph. Upon hearing about Joseph, Pharaoh sent for him. And after he was freshened up, they brought him before Pharaoh. Joseph was brought from the dungeon. The rumors had it that if Joseph, Joseph heard, hears a dream, he can interpret it. Joseph discredited the rumors, saying, I cannot do it, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Here, Joseph had one shot to impress. One shot to impress. To impress Pharaoh to get out of that place that he'd been longing for so long to get out of. He had one shot. It's like that interview to that job or to that thing that you so want, to that role that you so want. And you have that one opportunity to impress them. And jo will Joseph impress Pharaoh, or will he blow it? Joseph could have big himself up, say, I am the man. I am the one that interprets dreams. Yet, he chose humility. And this tells us something about Joseph and during those years of hardship. You see, Joseph had dreams, or it was kind of, sold into slavery when he was 17. And, for, and, and we are told that when he was presented before Pharaoh, he was 30 years old. It were 13 hard years. But glimpses of those years, we, we read that God was with him, and God made him successful in the house of Potiphar. And even though Joseph also remained faithful, it was God's faithfulness that saw him through those years. 
He was successful in the house of Potiphar, not because of his own ability, but we are told God made him successful. God was with him, working with him, character building and preparing him for the task that he had for him. Was it in a good place? Was it in freedom that he did that? No. He was in a place where Joseph had no freedom whatsoever. He had everything really to become rebellious and, and just kind of not want anything to do with this world. To become bitter about everything in life. The world had let him down. But God was with Joseph. Here, Joseph had that opportunity to impress to show off, to boast about everything, and yet he chose the path of humility. The credits will not be given to him when he interprets the dream, but they will be given to God. He makes the disclaimer, I cannot do it, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Humility was the biggest thing Joseph developed during those 13 years of turmoil and hardship. From th- se- 17 to 21, we see Joseph, uh, Pharaoh recounting his dream to Joseph. In 25 30 se- 30 to 32, we see Joseph interpreting the dreams. And the dreams, basically, we, we, there's no need to go into the el- meaning of elements because the author did not bother it. But the meaning is important, and the meaning simply, and it simply meant that for seven years they will experience plentifulness, abundance. But seven years after that, they will come famine, severe famine throughout the land, across the land, that will ravage. It will be lack of production. Michelle prayed about droughts. Uh, and the idea, the sense that is here, is that when it comes, the, the years of plentifulness would be forgotten because of the severity of the, the, the famine. And so Joseph gives the interpretation, and then he gives an advice to Pharaoh. Here, we can't claim that it was God that gave him the revelation of how to proceed, but God had trained him. And when God trains us, he gives us wisdom as well. We learn, we live, and J- Joseph acquired wisdom. Just a side note, however brilliant this idea, this policy was, the truth is, and this is just a side note, don't hold on to it, it's not part of the story. It is the very policy that ends up leading Joseph's own people to become slaves in Egypt. He was brilliant for saving the people on that day. But it is the same policy that ends up making people servants, slaves to Pharaoh later on. But he served a purpose on the day. And the truth is, our human brilliant ideas, they work in the present, and they do what they are called for for. But later on, someone might misuse them, and they end up instruments of evil. It's not that they were ill-intended. They were well-intended, well-meant, but someone along the line, in future, they may become obsolete and not good anymore. So Joseph advised Pharaoh, and Pharaoh sees a great idea out of that, to collect 20% of surpluses during those seven years of abundance and store them up in barns. And so they built all those places and stored up the surpluses. 20%, we pay a little bit more now. 21%. Is it still 21? Or have we gone? I mean, for some of us. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. Well, looks like they still kept Joseph's policy. So Pharaoh sees great idea in that. And so Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of his country and marries him to a senate. Now, one thing that Pharaoh observed was that 
Joseph had wisdom that none of his wise men had. He had wisdom that was above everyone else that Pharaoh knew. And Pharaoh also saw in Joseph a man in whom the Spirit of God was. That God made all those things known to, to Joseph. And so there is no one, there was no one discerning and as wise as Joseph. And so Pharaoh says, you shall be in charge of my palace. And all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. He also provided a wife, a daughter of a priest. And this could speak of the purity of the lady, which was important uh, back in those days. Joseph then, from 46, second part, to 49, Joseph implements the, the proposal, the policy, collecting surpluses, and he followed through that to the letter. And then Joseph has two sons with a senat, Manasseh, Manasseh, that is, sounds like forget. He says, because God made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The question here is, did Joseph really forget all the pain in his father's household? The goodness of God toward Joseph seemed to have made him let go of, perhaps, of the grudge and bitterness they had towards those who had made him suffer. And special those of his own father's household. In Manasseh, Joseph would be found, would find a joy that was greater than all the trouble he had endured. He can now forget all the hardships he had endured in those hard 13 years. God's provision and grace are now out in the open for Joseph to enjoy. There and then, Joseph must have let go of all that he had carried the burden that he had, the hatred perhaps, and named his first son Manasseh. The second was named Ephraim, the name that speaks of God making him fruitful. God was prospering Joseph, and he wanted to remember that. He looked at his children, and he would remember that. 53 to 56, famine comes and Joseph distributes the accumulated surpluses. When the seven years of abundance came to an end, the seven years of famine began. When famine began to be felt across the land of Egypt, the people cried to out to Pharaoh for food. Then Pharaoh told them, go to Joseph and do what he tells you. This resembles what God says in the New Testament. This is my son. Listen to him. The chapter ends with a note that all the world came to Joseph to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. I think if you were reading the story for the first time you, and you know what had happened, how this family was left back in a home country or nation, and, and you read that famine was severe everywhere. I, th I don't know about you, but there's a sense of expectation that they, will, they are about to meet. The family is about to come also, as everyone else come to Egypt to buy the grain. I would be looking forward to seeing the re reunion, how things would, be play, would play out. What can we say of this chapter? This chapter is all about God's faithfulness. It is God who promotes Joseph. It's God who places Joseph at a place of influence. It is God fulfilling his promise to Joseph. The word that he had given him, he showed him that 13, 14, 15 years Pre uh, uh, earlier, the dreams that he had given him, those were words of assurance that God had given him. 
He gave double dreams. And as we see here, we can take the Joseph's words a bit further and say, actually, Joseph learned through those double dreams that he meant exactly the same thing, that God would surely fulfill his word. There is something striking about Joseph here. When he comes out and he stands before Pharaoh, it's conviction that God would really fulfill what he had shown Pharaoh. That God would give him the interpretation, number one, and that God would surely do what he had shown Pharaoh. Where did, where did that conviction come from? That conviction comes from the intimacy that Joseph had with Pharaoh, even from within the pit. Someone says that Joseph was brought from the pit to the pinnacle, from the bottom to the top, just like that. He was in a gradual process. You could argue that it was a gradual process. But from one day, from one moment, he was there serving in a prison, and suddenly he is before Pharaoh. And suddenly he gets the authority to rule over the whole nation. That is not something that we achieve because we want to do, because we want to achieve. It is not something that we achieve because of our ability. It is something that is entirely God's work. It's God, and why did God do that? God did that for one simple purpose. And that you should see that in the coming chapters, to do what? To preserve his covenant. To save the people of his covenant. That's why Joseph, in his own word, he was sent there to preserve them. We could argue that actually it wasn't God who sent Joseph. God just worked with Joseph amidst his circumstances. It was his brother's wickedness and jealousy that sent him, that sold him into slavery. It was the greed and the wickedness of, of, of Potiphar's wife that got him into jail. And people may let you down, and they may ill-treat you, and they may display also of wickedness and sin against you. And that may affect you in many ways and give you all the reasons to become revolted and, and be against everything in life. But if you just learn a bit of jo with Joseph, to just remain in the Lord, live by his will, allow him to work through you, I guarantee you one thing. You will not be a loser at the end of the day. You'll be victorious. God made you with a purpose, and that purpose is committed to achieving that purpose. It's committed to seeing you through life and help you and raise you and build your character in the thick and in the hardships of life with one single purpose, to achieve his purposes. You see, as church, sometimes we think ourselves of ourselves as the most important characters in the whole gospel and kingdom narrative. We are called to be part participants in the building of God's kingdom. We are called to be members of this new kingdom. But the most important thing, as far as I know, is the church. How do I know that? I know that because we see that through Israel. Who was the most important thing? Were they the people? Was it the people or was it the Israel to God? You see, in disciplining the, the, the nation, many people perished. They perished because there was higher, a higher reason, a higher purpose, the preservation, the keeping, the, the seeing through of the promises of the covenant that he had celebrated. The nation was more important. And the same thing, the church is more important than myself. If I see myself as more important than the church, I'm a little bit delusional. Why? Because I'm called to the church. The church was not called to me. The church is bigger, is higher. Christ is coming back for what? For me, for the church. 
If I'm part of the church, I'll go. If I'm not part of the church, he will not leave the church behind and come after me. Joseph was God's instrument. You can be God's instrument in the building of his kingdom. You can be God's instrument to bring others to Christ. You can be God's instrument to change. Why not? Even nations. But would you humble yourself and allow God to work? Would you look at the world as God's? Would you look at yourself as a servant of God? Through whom he wants to do mighty and wonderful things. God made a promise to protect. He made a covenant with Abraham. That covenant carried on through Isaac. From Isaac to Jacob. And from Jacob, it seemed like he was going to carry on through Joseph. But no. Joseph was an instrument to preserve that lineage to save the people of God's covenant. Because his children, even though they took part in inheritance, they end up being part of the northern kingdom of Israel and not Judah. Which meant to me that there is a discontinuity in the lineage of Joseph from, uh, with the promise, his promised people. And so, Joseph was, and with, without a shadow of doubt, one of the most important characters. The author goes a great length, but it's not about Joseph's importance, it's about God's faithfulness in bringing, in, in fulfilling his own covenant promise and preserving the people that he promised to grow. In Egypt, they grow, they become numerous. And it fulfills the promise that one day they'll be as numerous as the stars or grain of the sand on the beach. This God is the same God that we have today. The God that will watch over us, that will protect us, that will see us through the challenges of life, the hardships, the tears and, and the tears of life. To bring us to place of victory, place to the pinnacle, pinnacle of life. What is success to you? Success in that story was not Joseph becoming a prince, uh, someone similar to a prime minister. It was God preserving his people, saving his people through Joseph. Let's stop here. It's God's faithfulness. That same God is faithful to you. I don't know what you're going through, but let me just say this. Joseph was no master. He went to no Harvard. He went to no Cambridge, no Oxford. He did not have a degree even. He was a slave boy that became a prisoner with no rights. And yet, in those low places of life, God trained him. And when he was finally promoted and brought up to the place, he was up to the task all because his master was God himself. Don't look down on yourself. Don't look down on yourself. Trust the Lord. Allow him to lead you through life, and he'll put you in places that you don't dream of, because he is the God of promotion. Father God, I want to thank you for being with us in this morning. I thank you that we can learn so much from your word. I thank you that you make a way, that you open up our hearts. They show us examples in your own word of your faithfulness, of your unchanging plan, O oh Lord, of plans that can never be frustrated. We could say that Satan tried to frustrate your plans by sending Joseph to slavery, but even there you were with him. And from slavery to prison, and in prison, there you were with him to prepare him, to train him to the task that you had for him. In the same way, O oh Lord, would you make your presence felt in us? Would you lead us? Would you guide us? Would you train us to be the men and women 
that you call us to be, God. May we experience and know of your faithfulness to God. All things indeed were for the good that love you, God. You are faithful, God. In Jesus' name, Father. Thank you very much. Um, that was very encouraging, I hope, to you too. Um, let's sing our final song for today. And as last time, I forgot to mention the offering. <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's collect that now. Is someone going to go around? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not too familiar with, you know, the Baptist. <laughs> I, I don't know. I need to pray for the offering now, which I gladly do. God, we thank you for the generosity of your people, God. We thank you for their willingness to give, Father. We thank you for the money that is coming in every week and every month, God. And we also pray that you would give wisdom to the leaders to decide how can we use that money for your kingdom, God. How can we use that money to, to feed the poor, to reach the unreached, God, to support those that need support, God? How can we build your kingdom with the resources that we collect here, God? We pray that you would bless this money, God, and that you would give the wisdom to make good decisions, Father, and how to use it for your glory. Amen.
maybe 20 minutes longer, I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, I just have one notice, if there's more, let me know. Um, on the 17th of September, we have Nigel's send-off service. It's a Saturday evening, right, together with the Portuguese. Um, and the morning after the Sunday, there is no usual church service, we will meet here at the usual time at 10.45 downstairs, and there will be some pastries, or coffee, tea, so we'll have some fellowship then. And afterwards, we will come up here to have communion. Is that correct? Yeah? Okay. Is there anything else that needs to be announced? No? Then, um, yeah, you are invited downstairs to some refreshments, conversations, encourage one another, um, and I'll just say a short blessing, and maybe we can stand up for that if it's possible. May God bless your mind and give it unity of thought and focus so that you are totally committed to building the kingdom of God and helping people find freedom and deliverance through Jesus Christ. May God bless your hands so that your hands become God's hands and your touch brings healing and restoration. And people who have been around you will know that they have been touched by the very hands of God. May God bless your eyes so that you see beyond yourself and see lost and hurting people, see the pain in their eyes, see the need all around you, and see that the fields really are ripe for harvest. May God bless your heart so that it feels what God feels and yearns for what God yearns for. May what breaks God's heart break yours and may his perfect and complete love flow through you to everyone you meet. May you not only speak Jesus and live Jesus, but be Jesus everywhere you go. May you be the pleasing aroma of Christ in every place and may every breath you take be a prayer, and every word you speak be a praise. Amen. <laughs>